Hello, Bill. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, and congratulations on a New York Times op-ed that has gotten a lot of attention and buzz. I, I appreciate that. Uh, it was uh, it, it took a lot of persistence to get it in, but uh, the editors there have been great, uh, and I'm uh, really happy they're, they're willing to work with me on this, and I'm glad to stir up a bit of discussion. It has started a good discussion, and uh, let's have a little bit of it here. I guess first, though, why don't you, uh, for those who haven't read it, it's called How Liberals Win, and it was in Sunday's New York Times. Um, but if you would just tell us a little bit about the premise. So the premise is uh, there's definitely a certain uh, attitude on some of the left that the last two and a half years have been a bust as far as advancing liberal progressive uh, policies and it's the fault of entrenched corporate power uh, that has squelched popular liberal ideas like, say, the public option uh, for health care. Uh, and until we eradicate the Citizen, Citizens United ruling, uh, all is lost. Uh, and let's put our, um, the bulk of our focus on that. And uh, I, uh, in doing some research on uh, what what Obama did right on health care that, say, Clinton didn't. And I was thinking that uh, the, the difference to me seemed to be Obama's willingness to work with the insurance and drug lobbies much more so than Clinton did. Uh, and I was reading up on FDR and OBJ, trying to think about what was historically different in their times. Why didn't they have to do the same kind of compromising as today? And I was assuming that the lobbies were less influential and the money was different and the media age was different. And then I was stunned to find out that actually it wasn't all that different at all, that LPJ and FDR had lots of compromising with, with corporate interests, uh, and they had plenty of influence that had to be reined in to get, to get things done. Uh, and so the, my point in the, in the article is the thread of liberal success is in finding that common ground with corporate America uh, and, and being willing to sit down at the table and driving that hard bargain. And you can find a number of instances where uh, – Presidents try just to take a corporate industry head on. Clinton in healthcare, uh, Carter in oil. Uh, I didn't get to this in the piece, but FDR and the utility industry, uh, and you just get crushed. Uh, and, and not the case of FDR because he had other successes, uh, but in uh, in Carter and Clinton's case, you know, losing the that, that big fight right out of the box. Essentially, in both their cases, this was their real signature reform effort in their first term. Uh, getting chewed up and spit out not only lost the battle but also lost the war. You uh, yeah. you sap let, your political. Let me ask. Yeah, go ahead. Let me ask you, Bill. Why? Um, so so the perception on the left is that that big business is is bad and uh, that you have to stand up to them and fight them, and you don't need them. They're they're um, they're. They're going to help. They're going to stop progressive reform. You're making the point that no, histor history tells a different story. Um, why hasn't that lesson been learned, though? If if you're if you are right, why has this been lost to history? Well, I mentioned this at the end of the piece. Uh, it's for an understandable reason. I mean, corporate America is a really untrustworthy bargaining partner. After these deals get done, it's not like everyone becomes best of friends and they build on their successes. Uh, they get squirrely about it. They try to water down the implementation. They, they sue um, some, on some of the rules. They um, try to strike down rules. Uh, they don't back the politicians that stuck their necks out for them. They still back their, their, their more conservative opponents. Uh, and then when a similar issue comes up, they pretend that the past deal never existed and that all will be lost if they do a similar deal again. So it's, they're really frustrating people to deal with. Uh, and so it's easy to forget that uh, sometimes you have to find a way to deal with people that you don't like very much. Uh, but uh, the, the, the presidents that have not heeded that lesson have paid a very, very steep price. Well, tell me what, you know, obviously, this piece obviously could anger a lot of progressives. What is, what has the response been uh, from the left? Well, I've got a range of responses. You know, there, there's from the hardcore Obama supporters, uh, you know, high praise, you know, this guy gets it, the, the, this shows uh, what a savvy operator Obama is, how this guy knows how to get things done far more than uh, some of his predecessors are. 
Uh, from the more occupied side of things, you, you get you, you start get some harsh invective, you know, corporate shill, one blog post at News Hoggers, uh, Steve Inns at Bill Share says, welcome to your corporate overlords. Uh, and this, but, but I've also found some, some middle ground commentary, middle ground within the left, uh, that, you know, Bill, I, I don't want to believe you. <laughs> I don't like having to confront this issue. But you, but you make a strong case, and I might just have to be, you know, a big boy or big girl and accept this reality. Uh, and that's sort of where I end on the pieces. Look, I, I, I'm not saying this is a fun thing to accept. This is not a, it's not as cathartic as just beating it an opponent outright. Uh, but politics is generally not a, 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 a industry where you get to spike the ball a lot. Um, have you heard any? I'm, I'm guessing the one group that you're not hearing from is. You're probably not hearing any Chamber of Commerce type Republicans saying that they agree with you. Yeah, for the, for um, those who think that I'm going to get a job now with some corporate lobbying outfit, <laughs> <laughs> but no one's knocking on my door saying thanks so much. I mean, these guys do us under under duress too. They're not thrilled about it. I mean, as I said, they tend to really be weaselly once the deal is done. Uh, but the point is, if in the circumstances where you can that the the liberal president can go to the corporate interest and say, "Look, I I got a lot of momentum on my side. I want a big election. I got a lot of popular support. Uh, this is this is going to happen one way or another. Uh, I want to do it in a way that keeps you in business. You know, I'm not trying to put you out of business. You don't have to fear me. So let's find the common ground. That dynamic, that bargaining dynamic, works for liberals, and I would argue it works for corporations. It works for business. Uh, that everybody wins in that in that circumstance, uh, and uh, when there's a fear on the business side that you just have to get us, uh, this is what happened with Clinton and healthcare. That there was, the insurance lobby at the time was sort of, as as was quoted in the book, the system they wanted to play a quote double game. They wanted to run ads trying to stop it while sitting at the negotiating table and doing the deal, thinking that it was going to happen anyway. And they, and they just want to strengthen their bargaining position. Uh, but they weren't getting to the table. And, they were, and it made them very nervous what was coming down the pike. So they dropped that Harry and Louise ad campaign before the bill got ridden and really drowned out uh, what Bill Clinton had to say, diminish his bully pulpit. Uh, and when Hillary tried to call them out and say, uh, this is a bunch of misinformation, don't listen to this ad campaign, they don't have your interest at heart. All that did was give them oxygen. They, they, they jacked up their fundraising, they quintupled their ad budget. So that, that's the risk. That's the risk when you have corporate America unified against you, they're gonna have resources that are gonna drown you out. And this is the tough part for liberals to, to, to accept, is that all happens in the legislative debate, not in the election season. Let's say the fantasy happens and you actually overturn Citizens United with, with a constitutional amendment. They, corporations can still spend money in the legislative debate. That's never going to change. They still have cards to play that are very tough to deal with. And it's the times when you can divide corporate America or diffuse it, or, uh, put them on an even keel and say, you know what, we're not trying to put you out of business. We can do this in a way that you do well and we do well. Uh, that's when I think liberal ideas generally advance. Well, from the you know the, from the conservative side, um, their their books, a uh, uh, capitalism for the people, uh, Jonah Goldberg, liberal fascism. Tim Carney has written a book about this and has written a lot about it at the Examiner. Um, conservatives are, are very concerned. Um, you know, there's this perception that conservatism and big business go hand in hand, but actually. Uh, a lot of free marketers, you know, make the point that that big business doesn't really want <laughs> free markets, that they don't really like competition, and so they can um, they can they can essentially government regulations help big business because onerous regulations, the only people who can comply are big companies uh, who have a team of lawyers or whatnot. So that's sort of the free market conservative argument. What you wrote is very concerning to that, that philosophy. Um, I, I'm wondering how much have you gone back and read and tried to, uh, to sort of understand where conservatives are coming at when they're outraged by your op-ed? 
I mean, to be totally candid, I, I have not read Liberal Fascism by General Goldberg. I have not read Tim Carney's book. I forget the title of it, but I wrote something uh, similar. Uh, and maybe, and maybe I should. Maybe that's my my failing. Uh, but to the extent that well, I, th I think we have a follow, I think we have a follow up piece. If you do, uh, I, I mean, I think you have a good idea there. But to the extent that I understand the general argument, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a point there. I mean, there, there, it's it's not a wholly idiotic. I mean, I think the fascist label is ridiculous. I mean, it's not fascism to negotiate an agreement with the corporate interests. Submitted to a democratically elected legislature to be voted on. That's not fascism. Uh, but and, I, and you, Matt, you generally don't use that label. You, you use crony capitalism more, which you know I, I think is a, a little bit more in the realms of you know fair debate. Uh, right. I, I do want to let me just say, you know, the theory is that um, socialism takes over the companies and the corporations, and that. Fascism, and there's a quote that's attributed to Mussolini. I, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but he, supposedly Mussolini says um, that fascism should really be called corporatism. And so the theory is that fascist regi regimes essentially co-opt corporations. They I believe, I believe FDR, had a, FDR had a similar quote like that too, uh, which is why it's sort of the, ne the, the next to the argument that if, if you're melding government with corporations, that er ergo is fascism. And I think it's very shady to say any kind of government negotiation with a corporate interest is therefore fascism. I mean, that's really stretching the argument. I, 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 either um, if liberals propose policies that businesses don't agree with, then they're socialists, and if liberals propose uh, policies that disagree with, they're fascists. I mean, it doesn't really give you a lot of room to work with. <laughs> well, that's um, interesting, and I think that um, that the point is that conservative, a lot of conservatives are so skeptical of the motives of liberals, um, and whether fairly or unfairly, that that uh, it's sort of you, you have a point there. <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, but, but I I think it is a fair concern that a deal could exist that is giving a favorable treatment to, a, to, a, to an oligarchy, if you will, uh, and makes it uh, harder for smaller business and entrepreneurs to come up with uh, fresh ideas. Uh, a, a deal that did that would not be that great of a deal. Uh, and, um, and I'm not saying that every compromise that could possibly exist is automatically a good compromise, either for liberalism or for business or for free enterprise or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the, the main point is that uh, liberal ideas have their best shot when corporate opposition is diffused in some way and a deal is struck. Uh, but uh, you certainly could have a deal that has negative consequences. That can happen. Right. And, 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 and look, let me just let's go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, because I want to make sure. Um, that, that folks watching appreciate the conservative free market concern. I mean, the um, the concern is that if, if government and business are colluding, that um, if you find a business that, that you can deal with as a president or as a government, it's in your interest to keep them around. And so um, essentially what happens is you – over time, you could create a culture whereby the way to get ahead is not through innovation, but rather through what's called rent-seeking, which is lobbying or um, seeking to comply with regulation. So that, in other words, over time, we have an entrepreneurial culture where producing widgets or the, the better product, the most innovative idea, isn't the way to win. Um, but it's 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 currying favor with the government uh, is is the way to win. And so, you know, businesses have limited resources, limited time, talent, treasure. You you could over time see uh, businesses devoting more and more um, of their you know infrastructure and, and you know energies toward currying favor with with government. And then this has over time again. This wouldn't happen overnight would have a, a, eventually could have a very devastating impact on morale. Um, the notion is that people are generally okay with income inequality as long as they believe 
that it's a meritocracy as long as they believe. And by the way, much of this is in Luigi Zingala's new book that I just read. So it's, it's fresh on my mind called A Capitalism for the People, um, which, which in, the timing was perfect because in a sense it was the perfect uh, response to your New York Times piece. Um, so, and I read them like simultaneously, so <laughs> it's sort of fresh on my mind. But the problem is that if you're somebody who, um, if you believe that if you work hard enough, you can create a company, you can get rich, whether it's true or not, if you believe it, that, uh, that keeps you, um, you now have an interest in this society. But if, you've, if you stop believing that, as, they, as a lot of countries have stopped believing, a lot of citizens of a lot of other countries have stopped believing, um, then all of a sudden uh, it, all, it all comes crashing down. And so there are many, many like big picture, long-term facets to this that when conservatives read your free market conservatives, not to be confused with people who just like big business, <laughs> um, which I think it's a distinction to be made, but when, when we read your... Like when I read your op-ed, my response, aside from being happy for you personally, because <laughs> um, it's it's a huge accomplishment and congratulations, but but I am um, now the enemy of, I, of I'm the enemy of freedom, and yeah, and I must be stopped. <laughs> but my my response was, I think Bill's right politically. Progressives would be wise to listen to him, but gee, I hope they don't, <laughs> because if they do, it's going to be bad for the country. Well, look, let, let me get back to your. I think your rent-seeking point is a very important one. And let me agree with you that rent seeking is bad. We don't want an economy that has an excess of, of, of rent seeking because that is not going to be a thriving, growing economy. Um, Joe Stiglitz actually recently made a, an argument that the, the deregulation of Wall Street has caused a lot of rent seeking, that the innovations that they were touting uh, as being really important, you must, please don't regulate us, we must innovate, all that innovation amounted to was rent seeking. Uh, then that's not to say that it can't happen under a allegedly liberal bill, but I would say if that did happen with a liberal bill, that it would not be a very good liberal bill. <laughs> that's not the ideal. Um, you, but in, in the types of things that we're talking about right now, um, for example, uh, uh, health insurance, um, it's not like we have all this wonderful innovation in the health insurance industry before the Affordable Care Act. They said they were innovating. They're innovating in how to cherry pick customers and maximize profits and 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 be cheap on care. And so when that's true, but I would uh, you're, I think you're completely right. Um, I would argue that much of the problem in healthcare has been uh, that the mar that there's not a, there there isn't a free market in healthcare now. Like. So, for example, um, this this whole you know during World War II, because of price controls, the only way that you could compete as a business was to offer superior benefits, and so people started offering health care. Then the tax system rigged it so uh, to essentially uh, essentially give us a, a, a society where it, it's assumed that your health care comes from your employer which I think is horrible for a variety of reasons. I don't think it's ideological. You shouldn't lose your health care if you change companies. We should have a free agent nation where you're not a slave to your company and where you can start, stop, go, go out on your own if you want, go to a different company, and you won't lose your health care. But my point is that comparing the mess that we had two years ago to the mess that we're going to have in two years Neither of them were, were free market, in my opinion. Of course, and the conservative idea, of course, to help rectify some of this was the individual mandate, which is to say, <laughs> let's let's have a free market based system. Everyone has to buy private insurance, so we're not caught into a stagnant government bureaucracy. But everyone is in the insurance pool, and that's going to help bring costs down. Uh, which is what what about now? I'm not saying conservatives can't change their mind about that if they so choose, but uh, and we'll and. Now that it's available, we'll see how well it works or not. But I, I, I think you can find an example where, and, and, and I, I say this not necessarily accepting your entire premise before, but I won't, I won't challenge it for our purposes today. Uh, it is possible that a regulatory idea doesn't work so great. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that all regulations are bad. It might mean you got to fine tune your regulations. Uh, and keeping in mind uh, the importance of entrepreneurialism and avoiding rent seeking is a good guide to gauging whether or not a regulation is working well or not. Uh, I think we have a situation now with energy where we don't have a free market system. We probably could never have a free market system because so much of the world's oil 
are part of our car cartels like OPEC. Uh, nothing we can do about that. Oil is a global market. Uh, but uh, on top of that, w the American government subsidizes oil drilling, you know, and, and, and subsidizes coal has for a long time. Uh, so uh, you can make a libertarian argument, and I've heard this on the left and the right, maybe we should have no energy subsidies at all, and let them all fight it out, and I would not be so I, I would I would more seriously consider that if you didn't have the global warming problem that I think needs to be solved uh, on, a, on a rapid timetable. So I can't just wait for the free market to work its magic. I got to get that done now, and therefore I want to see more regulations and more subsidies between energy to level that level that playing field. Uh, and I think that can be done. And the recent bill proposed I think would. Uh, do so with an eye towards supporting entrepreneurs and not supporting big business. I mean, even the, the clean energy subsidies in the uh, Recovery Act, which conservatives really hate right now, a lot of that, all these, you know, Solyndra is not big business. Solyndra is an upstart. <laughs> you know, they're trying to find ways to help upstarts get a toehold. And when you're doing that, you know, you're not going to bat a thousand. Someone's going to fall by the wayside because they're upstarts. Uh, and, but they're, they're at least what you can still not like it. You still think it's a bad idea for various reasons. But I, I don't think you can say the Obama administration had an eye towards uh, hugging big business and screwing small business in the course of their policy decisions. They had an eye towards helping entrepreneurs and having a more thriving economy. That was the intention, at least. Well, let's um, – we just, we just taped the podcast for my podcast, uh, The Matt Lewis Show, which you'll, you'll be on. Um, and while we were taping that, uh, Tim Carney at the D.C. Examiner fired off a response to your New York Times piece. And um, I wanted to give you a chance to answer it. Some of this stuff is, uh, is over my head, actually. <laughs> but um, I think there were three or four points he raises or, or, or criticisms he has of the piece. So let me just, let me just read what he's written here and uh, ask you to respond. I ask you to respond. Sure. He says, uh, here's one. Share rights that business got behind the National Recovery Act because FDR offered a temporary suspension of antitrust law. But I think that mischaracterizes the NRA. The NRA created, created government and forced cartels. Taylor Jacob Majid, Maggot? Majid? I don't know. Went to jail. Went to jail for breaking the cartel. Kosher grocers were prosecuted for, among other things, charging too little. Um, do you have a response to that? Sure. I, I, don't, I don't really understand what he's saying. Well, basically, um, there was a – the business community had a belief – that the way to get out of the depression was to fix prices, that prices were too low. They needed to get pushed up to, to stimulate more economic activity. And all this, I mean, I read, I read Arthur Schlesinger's uh, Coming of the New Deal, which gets into stuff in very big detail, and it, it made my head spin. I couldn't explain to you all the economic theory involved. It's, it's above my pay grade, too. So I, that, that's as far as I can take it, knowing that that's what they thought. They thought that the business community had to fix prices, that big business had to fix prices at a high level to get out of the Depression. Now, as – and the story about, about the tailor here, I, I did not read about Schlesinger's thing. My understanding is that came out of the Amity Schlale's book, The Forgotten Man. Uh, and what I don't know – is you know how overhyped is this one example? Was there widespread jailing of lawbreakers here, or were there a couple of fluky things? I, I just don't know the answer to that. But just take. All right, I'm going to I'm going to suggest to you, Bill, mm -hmm. that I think you have created a niche here. You should, and I know you've got a piece coming out on grist. Uh, yes. And, you know, taking this. This needs to become your raison <laughs> d'etre. It's a um, good idea. To, and, and so I would suggest, you know how, like, Christopher Hitchens did, like, Hitch reads Orwell or Thomas Paine or something? You should read Amity Schley's uh, The Forgotten Man. You should read uh, Luigi Zingales, uh, A Capitalism for the People. You should read Tim Carney's book on this topic. You should read... Um, uh, Jonah Goldberg's fascist liberalism, um, and, and you should you should write something responding to the right's concern about uh, this sort of collaboration. That is an excellent idea, sir, and I'm going to do that. I'm your assignment editor. <laughs> I appreciate that. So let me finish up this one point, though. Uh, so let, I was going to take yeah. Cardi's example at face value, though. You know, this this tailor got jailed because he, he his prices were a little too low, and that sounds pretty silly. Uh, I'm not arguing. That price fixing was good. <laughs> that wasn't the good part of the deal. That was the concession. 
<laughs> and in fact, in Schlesinger's book, he says it didn't even help. It, it, the, the evidence seems to be that it didn't help get out of the depression. That wasn't a great idea that the business community had, and it eventually got scrapped. I mean, in fact, that part of the of the right. law got struck down by the Supreme Court. Well, in fairness to Carney, I should probably read the paragraph that precedes what I read, which he, he says I think Cher's essay leaves the reader with the impression that big business wants to be left alone. I think a more accurate portrait would include all the ways in which big business profits from big government in ways they wouldn't profit in a freer market. So I think that you still may be right, but that puts what he said later in context. I sure, think. sure. But my, my point here is, is that you know, uh, I'm not arguing that, that in any compromise with big business, that all aspects of the compromise would be good things. I mean, the nature of compromise is that some parts are going to be things that you don't like or aren't good. Uh, and in this case, well, I think it would. It, I mean, after the Supreme Court struck down that part of the Recovery Act, FDR was able to resurrect the labor reforms. He was able to resurrect minimum wages and maximum hours and collective bargaining rights. He didn't go out of his way to resurrect the price fixing because that part wasn't working so well. Uh, so you know, that's it's okay to pass something that's not perfect, see how well it works, and build on it over time. Uh, I, I think that our constitution and our system of democracy is strong enough that we can handle a mistake like that and recover, and not think that if you do that, all of a sudden you're on the fast track to fascism. Well, the road to serfdom, as we may say. <laughs> Look, I think you've just hit on a. <laughs> A, a different. I think that liberals, we've talked about this before, I think that liberals tend to think that America is resilient and you've got to take whatever you throw at it. And in a sense, liberals are more optimistic about America. America can take anything. And I think conservatives are a little more uh, along the lines of thinking, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe what we have here is very special and, and a bit fragile. We don't talk about that a lot, but I, I, I think that that is a part of the, the, uh, the worldview. Well, I would say I, I am an optimistic liberal. I know that there, there are plenty of pessimistic liberals out there that are very concerned that what we have is, uh, is, is, is hanging by a thread and is all going to collapse in front of us here in a matter of a couple of years. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, but I, I generally speaking, uh, feel – certainly the more I read about history, I mean, people said some very over-the-top things about what was coming – in the Great Depression days, and look, it was a depression. I mean, you were, people's people's sense of security was really shot. I mean, it, was, it, it really raised questions whether the entire idea of capitalism was sustainable. And so people broke into camps of, well, you're going to have to be communist or fascist because capitalism doesn't work, you know. Uh, and that was obviously very overblown. That, that, that there was a way to save capitalism, and I would argue it involved some government regulation. Uh, but and at least that's the choice that FDR made. Uh, but people do have a tendency to. Uh, imagine the worst, feel like the current circumstance is as bad as it's ever been, because it's hard to retain and understand the context of everything that has transpired over the past 200 years. Um, before, I'm going to, so go off, go off on a little tangent here. Um, I want to come back to the DC Examiner, but did you read, because uh, I'll forget otherwise, did you read John Yu's Wall Street Journal piece on Obamacare? I did not. All right, you should go read it um, because he talks about um, – remember how we were talking about how um, even though um, e even though some of FDR's New Deal policies were struck down by the court, that they actually uh, ended up becoming implemented anyway? Right, right. So he, he actually talks about that. You should – you should check that out. I will check that out. I, I mean, love, fortunately, I we didn't have to uh, replicate that with, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, but I, I did think. It became think, a moot point. I wrote about that. But, <laughs> uh, but I did think because, uh, you know, he had explicit drug lobby support. He had sort of semi-neutrality from the insurance lobby. Again, they were playing a double game uh, again. Uh, and, uh, but in this case, the double game was sustained better. They gave money to the Chamber of Commerce to run ads against it, but they were still at the negotiating table. Uh, they never, you know, cranked it up. They never cranked it up to 11 to kill the deal. It, it was nothing like the Harry and Louise campaign. And even though they refrained from formally endorsing it, they have never subscribed to the repeal efforts. They've always been saying, look, we have to, we have to improve what we have and make it better for us. But by scrapping it after we, we've started the reform process, we're implementing some of these ideas. To make us go back to square one is bad for us. Uh, and if, if the Supreme Court had struck down the mandate only, 
which essentially blows apart the deal they had with the Obama administration uh, to uh, take the young and the healthy along with the old and the sick, uh, the folks with pre-existing conditions. You know, they would have been, you know, lining up at the doors of Congress saying, you got to salvage this or else before we go out of business, uh, you got to do something else that's constitutional to give us a similar result. Uh, and so to have that, you know, essentially support uh, in Obama's back pocket, I thought would have helped him deal with uh, the Supreme Court overturning it in a way that he would not have had uh, if he just rammed something through with a more more partisan uh, majority. Uh, you know, having having a broader coalition you know, comes in handy when you least expect it sometimes. All right, uh, let me get back to the Kearney piece. He writes sure. on LBJ share rights. He created the department the Transportation Department in 1966, only after exempting resistant shipping interests from its jurisdiction. But DOT promised plenty of positive benefits to big business. Right around the time Congress created the DOT, for instance, the FAA awarded Boeing and General Electric a contract for a huge supersonic transport project. A cabinet department, it was clear at the time, would become a huge treasure trove of government contracts. Bill, your response. I mean, just based on that alone, you know, my response is, so what? <laughs> you know, a national transportation system, um, you know, you're going to engage big business on that. There's only so much entrepreneurialism at the, at the small business level you can do when you're dealing with an interstate road system or an interstate railroad system or an air traffic system. You know, there's going to, big business is going to be involved in that. And so uh, to say, let's have some public-private partnership here um, so we don't just have a totally random set of routes that don't connect or make any kind of holistic sense. Let's do this in a way with some planning. Uh, you know, th there are certain areas where that's going to make a lot of sense. There's certain, you know, I, I wouldn't have the same approach to the nation's supermarkets, but it makes sense for our transportation system. Uh, so I don't think it's the strongest example. It's not like he's giving you an example there that sounds horrible to, at first glance. I mean, I would say most people feel like, um, you know, since Eisenhower's uh, internet, interstate highway system, you know, having uh, a federal role in our transportation system has not been a negative. Uh, then he goes on to talk about what, how you described Hillary Care, and he says, but the insurance industry wasn't uniformly against the bill until it started to fall apart. At first, Hillary caused a split in the industry. Big insurers managed care companies, sided with Hillary. Smaller and mid-sized insurers opposed the law and fought it. I don't think that's quite right. I, I mean, I'm sure there was differences of opinion with the different companies, but the head of the main insurance lobby, uh, as I said, I, I think I said it here, not on your podcast, uh, he, uh, as rep reported in the book, The System, uh, wanted to play a, quote, double game, wanted to run ads against it while talking to the Clintons uh, and cutting a deal, uh, and couldn't get in the door. Uh, that's not quite right. He had an initial meeting with Ira Magazine or very early on, one of follow up meetings and didn't get them, and that made them very nervous. Uh, I I'm sure if the process had gone along more smoothly, maybe some of those divisions within the community might have, might have been pushed up to the surface more, but it never really got to that point. You know, the, 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 the industry, the main lobby, bet against it before the bill got written. Uh, so I, 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 I don't think anything in Carney's piece here. Um, refutes your points in the sense that it disproves them. But I think what he's doing is is showing how um, that, that this collusion between big business and big government uh, has, has a downside. Well, yeah, you're, but we don't know what the final bill would even look like because it never got that far. Uh, just because there, there are competing interests in the insurance lobby doesn't mean that the final bill would have certainly screwed the small business side. You, they could have, I mean, there, there are small business lobbies. They could have had a seat at the table. They could have hashed out those issues and found something that would have worked for everybody. And as far as I know, I don't believe the small insurers are more angry at the Affordable Care Act than the big insurers are. At least I haven't heard that. Uh, if they are, then perhaps they didn't do a good lobbying job. But certainly all the things that I've seen with what Obama has done have generally been to, with an eye towards how can we tread lightly on small business. Now, there are small, this is not small insurers, but there are small business exemptions in the Affordable Care Act. They, they, have, they, have, they go out of their way all the time to say, look, we don't want to put the same burdens on you as a bigger business that could probably handle it. Uh, so uh, at, at minimum, 
there are ways to deal with those problems. Uh, the, the, the basic idea of having these negotiations does not negate the possibility you can make both camps happy. Um, so, so you wrote this piece on Sunday. I'm talking to you on Thursday. Uh, it has gotten a lot of buzz. It is, uh, I think it spawned maybe a book deal now where you respond to uh, <laughs> the liberal fascism charge. Um, maybe we, we write, maybe we write a joint book on this. I don't know. Hey. Um, <laughs> so I need uh, to hire Jonah Goldberg's graphic designer. <laughs> But what have you? What have you learned? I mean, this has been a whirlwind week. I mean, you, you were on. Uh, you're up in New York. You went on Elliot Spitzer. Um, what have you? What surprised you about this process? Um, the whole the whole process, and including the last week. And what have you learned from it? Um, I don't know if I've been terribly surprised. I mean, I uh, yeah. I, I guess the biggest surprise that I've had, and, and I won't. I won't say the person's name, but someone relayed to me, someone who is a pretty prominent writer, uh, who I don't know personally, uh, and is known for uh, his populist works, who who told a friend of mine privately, yeah, I don't like to admit it, but I, but you know he's right. Uh, and I, I, again, I, I hate being a buzzkill. I'm not trying to like bring people down. I am trying to create a circumstance where people have have hard heads and know what it takes to get things done, and don't go off on on bad political tangents. Um, but I was happy to see someone who I think is a very learned person, uh, uh, who uh, uh, certainly understands these issues very well, was able to look at these issues in a fresh light with something I wrote. I was personally gratified by that. Very well. That's a good feeling, and it rarely happens in this business. Uh, and when it does, it, it it feels really good because you know that's why you do what you do. Ultimately, I mean, yeah, the chicks and the money and the, it's, it's all great. I mean, being a rock star is great. But at the end of the day, you know, if you can move the needle, uh, win hearts and minds, and have people think that what you wrote was important. I mean, even and your, look, I, I, I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, it, it is impossible to change people's minds. <laughs> Don't even try. I, I'm not going to convince someone who hates Obama to like Obama because of this piece. Uh, what I think I can do, I think it's a good way to go about this type of, of punditry, is what new facts can you bring to light? that might change people's perspective, you know, as opposed to just browbeating you with your own opinion, right. uh, because that almost never works. That almost never, you, no one ever says, oh, I, I thought I thought it was right before, but now I realize I was wrong. No one, really people budge like that. Well, um, again, congratulations. I, I think it was an incredibly, hugely important piece. And even people, um, even your adversaries uh, can see that. So Tim Carney, and this piece uh, says liberal writer Bill Sher has an important essay in the New York Times that can dispel myths held by both sides. So uh, I think it's very respected if uh, even even while many of us disagree with much of, uh, of the advice. So congratulations, Bill. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, and thank you very much because uh, you've had a, played a big role in, in, in letting the world know about this. It's a, what, what it is interesting is that you know just having it in the Times does not automatically let the world know that you've written it. You still have to do stuff yeah. to put it in front of people's eyes. And you've done a lot of work on Twitter, even though you don't agree with the viewpoint. Uh, and I appreciate you spreading the word about that. Certainly, I think, you know, kicked up a lot, a lot of discussion. I think it has been a great discussion. I think it's good for us all to have this debate and this discussion. And uh, it's also good for a little this little thing that we have here we call the DMZ <laughs> when we are doing great stuff. So happy to help. And, uh, again, congrats on a, a terrific piece. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Well, uh, it's been a good show. And uh, maybe, who knows, maybe I'll have a – a New York Times op-ed to talk about that. <laughs> I'll just get started working now. What's it about a six-month lead time to get something? <laughs> Apparently. Think ahead. Right. Have a good one, man. Take, take care.